Welcome to the Homeschool Together podcast. Where one working mom and a stay-at-home dad help you navigate the nuts and bolts of the growing and dynamic world of homeschooling. With a focus on early learners. Like me! All the ins and outs of building and maintaining your homeschool life. Homeschool! Find out tips and tricks to make things like this easier. I'm reading! And ultimately, enjoy educating your kids. And what's that last thing? Have fun together! Did I do good, Daddy? (laughs) Yeah, you did, sweetie. Good job. Hello and welcome to Homeschool Together. Thanks so much for joining us. We have an absolutely fantastic interview with Maria Miller from Math Mammoth today. We're going to have, I know, it was a, it was a wonderful conversation with her. She She's was, awesome. She was really awesome. Um, and we're going to have a lot of links down in the show notes below. So make sure you take a look at that. We She referenced a bunch. Um, also, she sent us a, a, an additional links as well, and we're putting those in there as well so that you can click through, enjoy yeah, all the what practice we've been doing. things and yeah. resources that she listed. So, she just had a wealth of information for yeah, us. Yeah, we, we've been using the Math Mammoth curriculum with our, our kindergartner. We've been doing the first grade curriculum with her. We're about halfway through the first year, and it's been going really well, really fantastic. And we're very blessed to have Maria on today. She had just a ton of wealth of information on. Just the ideas and concepts around teaching math. If you're if you're a homeschool parent who's a little bit uncertain about teaching math or worried about teaching math, uh, Maria goes into a lot of that type of uncertainty, how to handle that, um, especially around the, how to correct around uh, errors mm-hmm. and some of the philosophy around how to teach so that it's a positive experience that's building as opposed to potentially causing a negative experience. She did a really wonderful job explaining that during this interview. Um, that that was a really eye opener for me. Something that I'm going to take home and, you know, put into my own practice. I, we always talk about when we do these interviews. There's always something there for everybody to learn. That you're going to get a little bit of a, a nugget here and a nugget there, and you'll be able to take that home with you. And I think there were a ton of them today with Maria. Yeah, I absolutely felt that way. You know, it's a curriculum that we've been using and enjoying, but it was good to get kind of the background of it. You know, she created this curriculum because the way that other curriculums were teaching math wasn't helping students to really have a strong foundation in it. And so it was really good to hear from her kind of, you know, how she created this curriculum, Mm -hmm. why it's set up the way it is, and, you know, some some ideas and thoughts about how we can help students that might be struggling in math or or... Um, might have problems. Our daughter is one of those that has a big problem whenever she gets something wrong. She just really struggles with getting yeah. back up and trying again. So Maria had a lot of great ideas for that. I mean, the whole process of math, it's there's going to be errors. There's yeah, always going to be errors that we, we need to go back and look at that problem and how we do it again um, and giving our kids that resiliency to be able to go back and do it uh, and really learn the concepts so that they have a good foundation. So important. So Absolutely. she was just wonderful. We are so yeah, we're happy to have really her. Really lucky. I mean, it's it's not just because we're using the curriculum and we like it. It's, you know, she's just very knowledgeable. And I think, mm-hmm. you know, whatever math curriculum you're using at home, I think you, you'll get a lot out of this. Um, yeah, I agree. W- whether it's Math Mammoth or something else. You know, we've We've talked about what we've used in the past, but um, just really, really um, a lot of great information. And so we're super happy here. So we'll, we'll just jump into the interview with Maria Miller of Math Mammoth. Hi, Maria. We are so thrilled that you're here to join us. Thank you for coming on the podcast. Thank you. I am excited too. I'm very happy to join you today. So, you know, can you just start us off by giving us an overview of Math Mammoth and your background and and how you created this curriculum? Okay. Um, My background is that I'm a math teacher. Uh, I got my education in Finland. But then uh, in early 2000s, I had moved. Actually, I was tutoring some homeschooled students. And uh, when, as, I, as I saw the curricula they were using, several different ones, I think at least four different ones that they were using, I just thought that they were all lacking, and in particular in one big aspect, and that was conceptual understanding. And so that is where I got the idea of writing math materials. I didn't start out by writing a curriculum, though. I just started writing topical, like little books, ebooks on say addition or multiplication, geometry, those type of things um, for grades one to five approximately. That's where I started. 
And I also made a website with lots of free math materials like worksheets and game lists and stuff like that. Homeschoolmath.net was that early website I made. And then I started selling these topical little units on that site in, in the early 2000s. And then as people bought those, several years into that, there was a tutoring company contacted me, wanted me to write worksheets at one point. And then also customers started asking grade level materials instead of these by topics, little units. And so several years after that, might have been 2006 or something like that, I started working on just making actual curriculum by grade levels, starting from grade one, of course. And so that took several years and, you know, there's been revisions and I don't know, uh, there's lots of stuff going on, but these original books that I started with are now the blue series. If you go to the website, the blue series books, they're still by topics. Okay. And uh, then I have the complete curriculum too, which, you know, was customer requested. And this uh, complete curriculum is currently for grades one to seven, though I am actually working on grade eight right now. And uh, it's available both in digital and in print. So people have the option, you know, or they can mix and match even by buying just the student books in print and then buying the answer key and the test and reviews as digital. And it's in a work text format. In other words, everything is in one book. The teaching and the exercises, the work, everything is in one book. There's also no separate teacher's manual. Um, though, you know, people have requested that several times, but I really haven't had the time to actually to delve into writing such. There's some notes for the teacher in the introduction of each chapter. And then the teaching, we have teaching, or I have teaching videos, which will work kind of like a teacher's manual in a sense, because, you know, I'm teaching the concept there to the child. And then, like I said, each lesson has the actual teaching in it in a work text format, like a maybe it's all in these blue teaching boxes. Mm -hmm. And so you start out with a little bit of a teaching and then there's exercises, maybe another little blue box goes a little further into the concept on the next page and then more exercises and so on. So that has worked well. You know, the majority of parents seem to be fine with that. And, you know, even though some have requested it like a teacher's manual, most people don't, they, you know, it is working. Great. Yeah, I'm going through the first grade book with my uh, my six year old right now, and it, you're right. It, the the way you outline the lessons and the the helping of the instructions and even the working examples, I find that to be you know more than sufficient to you know help the educator or the parent you know explain the concept or what what is going on. What 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 type of things would they be asking for that would be more than that? What would be in a you know a teaching manual? Well, it could be, for example, scripted, where it would have the exact words for the teacher to say, though I don't think I would make that kind of a thing. But then it could have notes that, okay, this exercise is especially for children who have trouble with such and such, or this exercise is to prevent such and such misconception. or And then it could have some differentiation there, such as this exercise is if you still need more review or if the child is not getting it, or this is for somebody who's more advanced, you know, those kind of little notes. But that's not something that you're thinking right now. You're probably going to keep right. it as is. Probably currently keep it as is because I'm busy now with the grade eight. So that's going to take me a few years. So can can you explain the 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 conceptual, because the conceptual part was missing from these other curriculums, how did that put students at a disadvantage? What what pieces of math were they were they missing? Uh, I'm just trying to understand how this helps students to understand math differently than other curriculums you had used. Well, it forces the child then to oh, forces or you know it naturally leads the child to memorize how to do something instead of fully understanding it. Now. Some children, even if the curriculum doesn't explain it, some children mm -hmm. still get the concepts because they're just bright enough, they, they see it, okay? But some don't. And so, yeah, it leads to memorization of, of these procedures. For example, you take fraction math, fraction addition. You're given the rule that, okay, find a common denominator by multiplying and da-da-da-da-da. And then you multiply this number by this and this by that, and then you add those, and here's your answer. 
Okay, that's teaching the procedure. So the child can memorize that, but maybe two months later they forget it because they never learned what it is based on, what is the concept behind that. Uh, another example that I've encountered with some parents that come ask for advice is that uh, the child seems to make a lot of mistakes in subtraction with borrowing or regrouping. And not all the time, but here and there, just kind of like inconsistently, they do the regrouping wrong. And the reason then is that they have not understood place value. They have not understood how this algorithm is based on place value. Or that you actually take 10, you know, take one of the tens and make it into 10 ones. They don't understand that. They just do it as a procedure by rote memory. And so that's one of the main things that, you know, children will be then hindered. And uh, it also, math is like a pyramid in a sense that, um, well, or like a building that you have a foundation and then you build upon it. So each piece of new knowledge is like a block in your building. And if you don't get the actual understanding of why, you know, the concept, then you will also not understand some of the future concepts, but you have to then increasingly rely on rote memorization without understanding. And eventually at some point, usually like somewhere in middle school, it starts crumbling if there's no conceptual understanding. Yeah, I, I've actually seen that. I've done some uh, math tutoring on, on the side a couple of years ago, and I noticed that problem where they're in abstract, maybe algebra two, and they're doing like FOIL method and things of that nature, re, you know, regrouping uh, factoring equations. And they're struggling with the basic addition because that wasn't just driven home on them. And it's just, there's a confusion there that you're actually right. Like it all starts crumbling apart when they need to be relying on the lower levels. Um, is there a philosophy when you are uh, approaching your math? Um, is there, may, maybe help us understand as, as parents and um, educate, you know, home educators, you know, is there a philosophy behind your, your math curriculums? Like, are there various math learning styles out there and you've chosen one of them? Is there a philosophy that you've chosen? Um, I didn't choose as such. I just started writing materials how I would teach it, which is based on how I learned it. Okay. But for each concept, I do try to think that how do I break it down and how do I scaffold it? In educational terms, it's called scaffolding. I don't know if you're familiar with that. And um, that is, you know, checking that what do they already know that I start building on? And then what's the first little step that I teach? And then I build on that little step to go to the next step, you know, scaffolding, like going up. I try to think that how do I understand this concept and how would I teach it, breaking it into little parts. So it's not any particular philosophy that I studied different ones and chose one, but just based on how I learned math. So it's kind of, I guess it goes back to the Finnish curriculum in that sense, because that's how I learned. Yeah, no, absolutely. No, I, I, I think, I think that's a, that's a wonderful way to put it. You, you said you were developing the eighth grade curriculum. Um, we had a question from one of our members or one, one of the people in our community, um, whether you were going to do the eighth grade curriculum. And I think that's been answered. You're, you're doing it now. Um, are you thinking about doing something for uh, kindergarten or K level curriculum? That's definitely an option someday. Yes. Is there, is there a reason why you initially recommended that folks start their children in first grade as opposed to kindergarten? Are they, are they like at a better um, mental development level to start math work than they would be in kinder or is that just a natural starting point? No, I just haven't written anything for kindergarten. I actually recommend that people start with kindergarten math or earlier, however they feel comfortable. And I have a an article on my site where I have a few kindergarten concepts listed and then a few kindergarten workbooks that, you know, you can choose between most any kindergarten math workbooks work, you know, because it's such an easy level of math. So, yeah. So for, for our, our listeners who are home educators, one of the most common um, worries that folks have when they start homeschooling is teaching math. Why is there such a stigma around teaching math that people feel that, you know, it's, it's going to be too difficult. I'm not sure I can handle this. I think it boils down to how well the parent understands math and how they feel about math. I've had plenty of customers also who 
are very confident about teaching math because they know it, they studied it or whatever, they learned it well. But yeah, I understand. It, it just kind of boils down how these, the majority of parents were taught themselves in school. And then it goes back to, you know, the prevailing curricula in the United States and the prevailing teaching methods. I don't know if you're aware of this, but um, in the United States, it's all right to admit in a casual conversation, let's say in a party or whatever, it's all right to admit that, well, I can't do math or I'm bad at math, you know, but people are not comfortable saying that, oh, I'm bad at English as far as, you know, just English language in general or some others. But it seems like admitting I'm bad at math is socially very acceptable. And then often, you know, people might say that, yeah, I, me too. I never could understand it. You know, that, those type of conversations are, okay, come on. That's not true in all the world. It's something ha happening in the US. It's not in Finland. It doesn't happen there. <laughs> so people uh, don't have a fear of math there or they don't think that it's especially difficult from the beginnings or whatever. So it, it's a cultural thing for one thing, but also boils down to how it has been taught in schools. And so that's how the parents, they got their attitudes from how they were taught and, and they didn't learn it well because it was not taught well and you know, so on and so on. And so then they also perpetuate it with their children. If, if a parent has had a, you know, maybe a poor background in math, they feel like they're one of those people that would say at a party, I'm bad at math. Uh, how should they approach math with their children? How, how should they kind of get over, you know, their own childhood to be able to teach their kids? I would say to try to learn it first yourself, you know, a concept by concept, maybe such as, you know, watch videos, my teaching videos or other people's teaching videos. And, uh, you know, get over at least that part, say let's long, long division or whatever, you know, learn it so that you can be happy about your skill that, that you know how to do it. And um, then use other teachers, like, like in today's world, there's so many videos. You can have the child watch other teachers, me or others, to uh, teachers that are enthusiastic about math, those kind of teachers. So that the child, you know, if you can't teach it, then use videos to have, to have somebody else teach it. So those would be the biggies, basically, I feel. Today we are very fortunate with the videos and YouTube, you know. There's some channels where, where people are even people are even, you know, funny and and you know, well made videos here and there. You know, speaking of you just you know, okay, so that's great. So the parent goes out, does a little bit of education, gets comfortable finally with doing doing that task. When they're sitting down with their student, we we tend to have a lot of early learners on our podcast and in our community. So we're talking about like pre-K all the way up to like maybe third or fourth grade. Um, how much time, you know, is expected of a home educator um, spending time teaching math to their student? I, I find I do about 15 to 30 minutes a day. And I find that to work, work well for, for my daughter. Is that a normal or is that you know, is that too much? You know, what, what have you seen on average to be the expectation and how much time people should be spending? I would say that 15 to 30 minutes is good. And uh, I actually hesitate to say any exact length because children vary so much and many have attention problems, for example. So it really, in my mind, it would be up to the parent to decide. And, uh, you know, some get it real quick and they only need 10, 15 minutes. Some like it so much that they go for, an hour just doing pages and pages because they just like it so, so you can't really say that it should be this long you know you, you can try you know if, if your child is going to be tested at the end of the year then you need to somehow try to get through enough material so that they will pass the test right but as far as on a daily basis I mean it, it just really I think it should be up to the parent and uh, maybe in middle high school they can handle an hour of math you know, if they don't, they don't have these different learning disabilities and stuff. And in early years, yes, 10, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, just depending on the child. Do you recommend that we approach math every day or should we, should we maybe break our days up, do math on Monday and then do it again on Wednesday, give, give chance for those concepts to take root, or is it more important to do it every day to get that, you know, repetition and practice I would say do it at least three or four times a week. 
but you know every family is different and every child is different so it can still vary some but but yeah it's going to be good to you know several times a week not just two times a week or whatever yeah i, th- no, I, I think this goes I to agree. the concept of of practicing so that you know students can achieve mastery mm-hmm. so you know talking about that what is it about practice that helps us really solidify concepts you know it, it does it I mean, because practice could also lead to memorization. And I was one of those children who memorized, by the way. And I went all the way into engineering school and uh, in college and had some problems because I was a memorization kid. So how do we make sure that they really got the concept and they aren't just moving on to practice, practice, practice? Oh, yeah, I know how to do this. Because as a parent, when they get done with, you know, two pages of math, they get done with a section. I can't tell necessarily whether it's because they figured out the formula and they practice, they you know, they memorized it or they really understood that concept. How do we tell the difference as home educators? Okay. You have two questions here. (laughs) I think at least, um, if I go back to the practice now, practice is needed because math, you know, I, I focused or I emphasized that conceptual understanding earlier, but that's not Mm -hmm. quite enough because to really become proficient in math, you also need some practice so that certain things become more automated like long division we also need a procedural mastery so to speak to be um very efficient when you know going forward in math such as multiplication tables it's a very good example when you're practicing memorizing five times eight or something that's not conceptual okay but it's still necessary for certain things to practice them so that they become automated And then when you come to something like prime factorization of 72, um, then it's in your memory that they times nine is 72. So it's just like that. It's there. You don't have to take five minutes to try to uh, find all the possible multiplications that might lead to 72. And eight eight times nine is actually in the prime factorization, but you start there. Then you go to four times two and, you know, three times three and so on. So. So it's kind of like a blend of the procedures and concepts uh, if we really want to do it perfectly. And uh, so the practice comes then in, you know, re- in enough repetition that certain things are pretty automated and I don't have to think about them very much anymore. Just like in algebra, the, the FOIL method or whatever, you practice it several times so that it's like an automated process. And then your brain is freed to higher level thinking when you go to the next concept. I uh, hope that makes sense. No, yeah, it absolutely does. I, I, I'm actually, you know, in the, in the first grade curriculum that, that we're going through, we're almost done with the first book. Um, I've noticed this where my learner, going to what you were saying, that she's, she's done really well on, you know, subtraction and addition. She's starting to you know, understand and not necessarily memorize, but able to see the numbers in her head and see the, you know, the number line moving up and down. Um, But then I I see where she's maybe missing on some of the conceptualizations when we do the word problems and she's getting kind of, you know, a little confused there and, and okay, now we got to go back and and redo our thinking on this. I I, I've seen this, this actually play out as we move through the book. And um, it's very interesting to to see that as cues to say, okay, maybe we haven't mastered this one little aspect yet before we move on and we have to go back and do this. I've actually seen this actually play out. So, but how, how yeah. do we, how do we know? Maybe, maybe this is the answer to the question. Yeah. Maybe we need to present problems in a different way. I want to make sure that my daughter understands that concept and doesn't, sometimes if she works through the whole page, I'm like, Hey, you got it. Great. Yeah. You know, she takes the assessment. Great. But what if they don't have that conceptual background? How can we see that and and tackle it? Um, yeah, I see the problem as well as, you know, it could be difficult to see. It should come about if you, um, in, in a later time, it may not actually show up right then. But then at a later point, a little bit later, I mean, months later, whatever, uh, you should be able to notice it in a review problem Let's say it's multiplication something, multi-digit multiplication. So they do well, but then there's a review problem later on, and then uh, they they can't get it anymore. They've forgotten how to do it, and they can't get it back at all because they don't have the concept. Then that is one way 
you you would notice it a little bit later on. But uh, this um, practice, okay, it's important because important because for the reasons that I already mentioned, but also as a child is practicing with problems, this conceptual understanding and procedural kind of uh, work together. They increase each other as long as the problems are not just mechanical same type all the time, but there's, you know, problems that provoke them to think a little bit about the concept. You kind of want a mixture so that, you know, let's practice these type of, say, multi-digit multiplication for a little bit, a page or whatever, and then let's go to a word problem or something uh, that asks them about the concept or maybe missing numbers here and there, you know, so that they have to challenge their thinking. It challenges their thinking and, and forces them to use the concept and then maybe go back to practicing the procedure again and kind of back and forth a little bit. So as you go back and forth with those, the conceptual side and the procedural side for say several days or could be several weeks if it's uh, depending on the, the skill, then it should solidify. Uh, that 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 sounds that sounds maybe a, an adjunct to that is something that as as a you know a young educator myself uh, for a young a young kid and I, I've only been doing it for a couple of years. Um, could you talk a little bit on the nature of correction, um, understanding when things are wrong, and do you have a is there a philosophy that you've you've had in the in all of your experience educating and teaching on how to correct when something is wrong? I. I know sometimes a lot of students can get very down when they feel like they failed at a problem or they've gotten something wrong, or they can be very, very high when they feel like they've gotten them all right. You know, how, how do you correct math in a positive manner? Is there, a, is there a method there or a way of thinking that you have? Yeah, it's not actually my thinking. Uh, I have learned it mainly from somebody called Joe Bowler in California. Uh, she has a website called YouCubed ucubed.org and uh, she has been advancing these ideas a lot but it's based on neuroscience and uh, there's been studies uh, which basically you want to value mistakes you, you want to show the student that I value this mistake is valuable so that they the student will also learn to have that attitude to make a mistake this is a valuable learning moment Okay, because if you don't make mistakes, you're not actually, you know, you're sailing through, you're not learning anything new. You may be practicing something, but but when you make a mistake, that's a point in time when you can really learn. And so the neuroscience comes in and has proven that our brain grows at that moment when we think about our mistakes. The brain makes new connections, okay? There's actual growth of those neurons and connections between them happening in the brain as you think about your mistake. Now, if the mistake is just brushed off, then, okay, this was wrong, the right answer is 11, then the growth doesn't happen. Uh, it has to be that, you know, the child actually is given time to look at the problem and try to think about it and get some help. Of course, they may need help uh, that, okay, notice now, what if you, you know, why is this this way or something, some kind of prompting questions that help them to start unraveling their own thinking process and trying to discover where it went wrong. So valuing mistakes is, you know, like my main advice there. It can be difficult for the parent to kind of change their mode of working there. But like I said, there's materials. If you go to Joe Bowler's website, you can watch videos there and, you know, learn a little bit more about that process. Another big no, no, is to tell the child that they're smart. <laughs> because that then makes the child, it brings an expecta expectation in, in the child's mind that I should be able to do this, whatever it is. And so let's say that every day the child finishes their math work. Let's say for three days in a row, they finish their math work and they do well. And you say, you are so smart. Fourth day, there's some challenging problems on the page. Now the child has in their mind this mindset that I'm smart. I can do, I should be able to do it. So then they can't do it. And so then that makes them think they are dumb because the parent told them you're smart. 
but but then they couldn't do it. So now they're dumb instead. So yeah, the praise that we give students needs to be to the work, not to the right answer. You know, and I don't praise the right answers as such, or their brain or their smartness, but praise their hard work. If you worked hard, you learned this. And then that encourages them to learn more and to work hard again when they encounter the next challenge and persevere there and not give up. The children who are told that they're smart, they give up real easily when there's a challenging problem. And those who are told that, you know, you work hard and you achieve because of your hard work, uh, then, you know, they keep going and then they learn even the challenging problems or the more challenging uh, concepts. And this is based on neuroscience, not not my ideas. So is this something that you would recommend for those kids who are struggling with math? I mean, this is a good first step to talk about it the right way, but what if you have a student, you know, we're going through your curriculum and and it's just not clicking or our, our student is really struggling. What what do you recommend we do, you know, to supplement what you have there to, to help our child kind of break through when they have blocks and they, they just can't understand a concept? I would say to first find out if there's gaps in the earlier concepts. Like I gave you the example of subtraction and place value. Sometimes children have a block with, with regrouping because they didn't actually understand place value. And so for that type of stuff, you would then um, maybe want to test them. I have on my side the placement tests. They work as generic assessment tests. So you could use those for starters. But that is the main thing you need to start suspecting that is there some earlier concept that they didn't grasp? And that's why this concept is now very difficult. And then, of course, there's learning disabilities. I'm not an expert on those, you know, but there's others who are. I've, you know, sometimes had parents that uh, contact me and then I, I suggest that to them that maybe there's something like that. I don't know, but, you know, if you can find other resources, other people to contact and find out, have tests done or whatever. Uh, that's always a possibility. And then sometimes a child may struggle, but still keep learning, still keep progressing. And so then maybe they are just that type of a child that, you know, math comes kind of slowly to them, but there's nothing else wrong as such. So those are some of the main possibilities. And there could be others, you know, I'm not actually an expert on everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, no. Uh, um, I have a question regarding maybe, maybe just kind of going along with the same idea of struggling. You have these um, uh, reviews at the end of every chapter, and then you have an exam or kind of a test. You know, I don't know if it's a test at first grade, but you know, it's a test. She sits down, takes the takes the problems. Is there a threshold of competency on those exams before? that will allow us to move on? Are you looking for like 80% complete, 75% correct, and 90% correct? Is there like a, a a trigger threshold for the parent to know, okay, maybe they haven't gotten enough concepts here. We should, we should go back and redo some of this. No, not really. I mean, I don't even recommend that you necessarily use the tests. Basically use your judgment whether to use the tests or not. For some children, the testing causes anxiety, right? Math anxiety, that's not good. So in that case, you would want to drop testing altogether, at least for a while, to build confidence. Uh, but my own children, they seem to all just enjoy the tests. <laughs> so that was good, you know? Ours does too. She ours, always asks for the tests. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, typically children like to learn as long as there hasn't been some negative experiences associated with math or learning or anything, right? And so then... You know, it can be a confidence builder that they did well. But the tests can also be used by the parent to kind of check and see that, okay, do we need to go back to some concept or not? But, but you know, some children are just careless or maybe they're tired and the errors are just um, kind of random careless errors. So I can't say that it has to be 70% or 80%. It just has to be the parent's judgment, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you will notice when you go to the next chapter that, okay, if the child struggles, then that's the, the best sign to go back. 
So do you have recommendations for uh, other books or resources offline that could help to supplement if we've already worked through the problems uh, in Math Mammoth and we think our child needs more practice or maybe needs to see a concept in a different way? Do you have some good recommendations maybe for some offline things? I know we talked about online instructional videos, but for those of us that want to get our kids away from the screen for just a few minutes, what do you recommend? Um, What are your favorite resources? I have on my site one downloadable book called Acing Math, which is a collection of card games. And so that covers most of the early, well, early elementary concepts, addition, subtraction, multiplication, those type of thingies. It's a nice collection. So card games can be used for extra practice. And um, then uh, we have created skills review workbooks to go along with the Math Mammoth curriculum to provide some extra practice. And they are actually written in a spiral manner now so that they review concepts in a spiral manner. Skills review workbooks, okay? You can find them on my site. And so you can print those out or by the printed version of, of the books. That's something totally offline. Then the curriculum comes with a worksheet generator, which you do have to you know, use it online, but then you print the page. So then it's offline after that. And the worksheet generator covers all the main calculation type of aspect, type of problems, also a few word problems here and there, a few geometric topics. But it does focus on some of these where you, you know, where you have to practice the procedures a lot. I don't know if you're familiar with that aspect of the curriculum. So yeah, those are the main ones that I know of as far as for offline. Now there exist, of course, all kinds of board games, you know, math games that you can buy on Amazon, whatnot. I cannot really recommend just any one. And typically the board games, if you buy them, they focus on one concept only, right? So then, you know, you have to buy lots of them. The card games book that I recommend is really nice because, you know, you just have a set of cards and you can have these dozens of different games and concepts that you can practice just with that, that one thing. Yeah, that looks like a really, I know you sent that to me earlier, and yeah. we're going to put that in our show notes. So if you're listening, you can check that out in the show notes. Um, so those are offline. What about digital resources? If we do want to you know, use our vast internet resources to help our kids with math, do you have some favorite resources there? Uh, yes. Um, Khan Academy is one because they have, you know, they used to start, they used to just have videos. But then they added this huge amount of exercises, actual online practice exercises to their collection. And, you know, they've had a lot of funding and they've had a lot of teachers working there. Those exercises are pretty good. So that's one of the main Mm -hmm. ones I want to recommend. Just for practice exercises. Then for games, online games, Math Math Mammoth Curriculum and the Blue Series books both, they actually come with a list of other online games. For the Light Blue series, it's per chapter. For each chapter, there is a list of online games and illustrations, activities. Occasionally, there's actually also board games or you know free board games included there. And so you can use those lists if you purchase the curriculum. Um, mm-hmm. I will mention just one website, transom.org which is very well thought out games. And it's a large, large site, uh, math game website, I should say. One math game website that I would recommend the most is that one, transum.org. And um, I don't know, I have not kept up with apps as far as for phones, but there's lots and lots of those too, of course. And then if, if you want to, um, beyond Khan Academy, if you want to have just uh, math practice, extra practice, then, um, there's several online math practice websites that are by subscription. You have to pay. IXL is the one of the most comprehensive ones as far as the list of skills they provide. It's just huge. And there's others like it is. Splash Learning, and Mathletics. Several of those have a free trial. You can try it out for a week or two weeks first before you commit to you know, subscribing. But Khan Academy really goes a long ways, even without buying anything. Absolutely. No, I agree. Khan Academy and IXL are are good resources as well. Um, 
we're kind of getting to the end of the interview before we we part i have a question and maybe it goes to the sound effect we just heard <laughs> what is with why mammoth in your name was there a meaning behind it did you did you do you just have a are you waiting on pins and needles until we clone the woolly mammoth back <laughs> <laughs> No, it kind of boils down to my lack of English language, maybe. I was just trying to find something that would rhyme with math a little bit and be memorable for people so that they would remember the name. It's very memorable. <laughs> it is. It so, is. And everybody knows Math Mammoth. Everybody. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. If somebody, you know, with a native English speaker would have been thinking about it, they probably wouldn't have chosen it. But I chose it just based on how it rhymes, basically. And <laughs> hey, hey, listen, the, the, one of the most listen, one of the most popular phones in the world is made by a company named after a fruit. It's totally normal. <laughs> you're, you're you're right in line with whatever. Yeah. I love the name. I think it's great. I know. I think it's good. Yeah, I want to add one thing. There's been lots and lots of children who just love to have their own mascot mammoth to do math with. I have a link on my website to Matty. Hold on, I'll show you. Of course, um, of course you know, you can't. Oh, this guy here. <laughs> that I've awesome. used in the videos, you know. But I have a link. You can yeah. buy a clone of him, you know, on Amazon. <laughs> or some other <laughs> stuff to one. But I've received lots of letters, you know. Well, quite a few letters from uh, parents where they say that their child just loves having Mathy there on the table or maybe on the shoulder or something while they're while, <laughs> their own math math yeah while they're doing math work uh, and uh, it just makes math somehow more enjoyable to them and so i was surprised to hear that it's great it's like a math mascot <laughs> exactly and i was surprised to hear that but it keeps happening that you know it makes math somehow more personable to these kids when they have their own mascot that sits with them there during the math time on the table or on the shoulder or wherever, you know? So, yeah. I think we're going to have to get one of those for our yeah, daughter. We'll, we'll get one. for. <laughs> we have absolutely loved having you here. Thank you so much for joining us. And um, before we part, you know, you coming from your background as both a math teacher and a homeschooling mom, you know, what, what kind of words of wisdom would you like to leave our audience with? What, what's like one thing or two things you'd want them to really remember and take away? I would say, um, watch your own attitude towards math-related things, just in everyday life, everyday conversations, uh, so that you don't ever show any negative attitude towards calculations, math, math concepts, but instead try to do just the opposite. Show a positive attitude towards math in your everyday life, in your everyday conversations, because children will assimilate that attitude. Our children are like sponges at all times. You, you know, it's not just math. It's not just at math time, but at all these other times, if somebody comes up and adult starts talking, I don't know, I can't do math, then, you know, counteract that or something so the child doesn't hear it. And uh, so once they get this really positive attitude towards math and, and keep it, um, I should say that children really start with that. Um, early learners, they like math. They like counting numbers and shapes and that type of stuff. So as long as we don't, you know, destroy that attitude by our, by how, by our own attitudes, then it just makes math learning for the children so much easier. One of the main attributes of any good teacher, whether it's history or whatever, is that they are enthusiastic about the subject. And those are the kind of people that people like to listen to, right? And learn from. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so however much you can muster that kind of an attitude in yourself towards math, then the better your children will be in learning math. Even if you can't teach it beyond fifth grade yourself, but have to rely on videos and books and tutors and whatever, they can keep going. And, you know, they're not hindered by anxiety or just thinking that I'm bad at math, or whatever. There's no, those hindrances won't exist. And so they can succeed and exceed it's not you know they can really do well that's great that's a great note to leave it on we all have to remember our our attitude and what we put out into the uh our learning space for our kids yeah that's great 
thank you so much. This has just been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for making the time to talk with us. You're welcome. It was my pleasure too. Thanks so much for joining us today and making us a part of your homeschool journey. Please engage with us on social media. Join our Homeschool Together podcast group on Facebook and find us at Homeschool Together podcast on Instagram. We'd love to hear your feedback, questions, and recommendations. Until next time. Happy homeschooling!